that's it. Uh, I'm going to pass the floor over to Robert. Everybody, please uh, welcome him and his presentation. Let's see if there's slides for you. You didn't quite change that. Yes. Uh, should, should I wait for them? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay. So before I start the presentation proper, I also have a little announcement. Uh, last year, I wrote some challenges, um, uh, to, like where you try to like break it or whatever. But the goal was to s sort of test skills that you don't normally see in competitions like this. And the first challenge I made was this sorting server uh, in Python. So you go to it and you pass it some numbers to sort, like this. Oops. And it returns the numbers you put, gave it in sorted order. But the thing is that the server also has a secret flag in it. Um, and you have to figure out a way to find out the flag by interacting with the server. So I posted a link on the forums. And you can also uh, just take the source code and run it yourself if you want to test it. I, then the second set of crack I made is a, a group of Java program, well, Java bytecode programs, where the goal, it's just a jar that you run, and you put, give it a number on the command line, and it tells you if you're correct or not. And the goal is to figure out which number you need to put in to make it say correct. And I've currently written three of them. The first one's been solved by two people so far. The second one's been solved by one person. And the third hasn't been solved by anyone yet. And you can find all of them by searching for Warsaw on crackmes.de or just going to the links on the form. I, also, on the hint, as a hint for the first one, I wrote an open source tool that kind of trivializes it. So like, if you're good at Google, you should be able to do it. I, OK. So the main uh, subject of my talk is sort of a more advanced techniques for cross-site scripting. Uh, so hopefully, most of you already know what cross-site scripting is. But I figure probably some of you are new, so I thought I'd go over it a little. Uh, XSS is abbreviation for cross-site scripting. Usually, it refers to finding a way to trick the browser into executing your JavaScript or Flash or whatever uh, in the context of someone else's domain so that you can get access to that website. And yes? So would you would JavaScript or JavaScript? Well, I mean, you, you can also do it with Java. But with Java, it has like a bunch of vulnerabilities. So you can, like, if they haven't updated, you can just directly infect them. Uh, and I mean, you could do cross-site scripting with Java, but it isn't a big source of focus. Uh, JavaScript is the main one because it, it runs in all the browsers. I mean, you can disable it, but a lot of websites require it. Uh, Java is much more commonly disabled, and it also like loads this huge big applet instead of being integrated into the web page nicely. Yeah. The other thing is that Java and JavaScript are completely unrelated, except for the name. Sort of like do like turtles and turtle doves. Uh, yeah, it's just a common misconception. OK, so cookies. Uh, HTTP, which is the protocol you use to communicate with servers and browse the web, uh, is a stateless protocol. So normally, like you make a request and it returns the thing you requested, but it doesn't keep track of information. So in order to handle like people being able to log in and stuff like that, the designers added a feature called cookies, which is a small text file the browser can store. So when you first request the page, the server can tell you, hey, remember this bit of information. And then on a future request, the browser sends that cookie to the server. And so the server knows that it's the same browser as before. And that way, you can implement someone like being logged in or just remember what they said on the previous page or whatever. So everyone got that, hopefully. OK. 
Oh yeah, I was going to do a little demonstration of XSS. So the thing is that uh, so as you can see here, I just type, typed in some JavaScript code into a text box, and then that JavaScript code is being executed here. Uh, this JavaScript just pops open a message box, uh, which is often the test string you use when trying to look for XSS. But you can, but XSS lets you execute any JavaScript, so you can do anything. It's essentially executing code on the victim's browser. So you could like change the color of the website if you wanted, or you could steal all their cookies, or you could like do a port scanning on the internet in some cases. Uh, so, one of the things you can do, yes? So, in this example, when you type in alert XSS, what, what happens in the script go? So, the thing is that a lot of websites have user input, of course. Like, you can type in a username or a message for a form or whatever, and then that text will be included in the website. I, but the thing is that if they just include the user's text directly without trying to sanitize it, then uh, you can just type in HTML code and it will run that HTML code as if it was part of the website. So for example, here I typed in alert XSS and it's being included directly in this website inside a pair of script tags so it gets executed as JavaScript. Uh, normally, you'd have to supply the script tags yourself, but I just had to add them automatically for convenience here. Uh, so more commonly, you would write like bracket, uh, script, bracket, alert, whatever. So can everyone see how that worked? Okay, so one of the things you can do with uh, JavaScript is access the user's cookies. And so you can just read the victim's cookies and send them all to your server. And the problem with that, of course, is that the cookies are used to keep track of whether you're logged in or not. So if you grab the victim's cookie, you can just use it yourself and pretend that you're logged in as the victim, which is obviously a big security risk. So the, the yes? Yeah, it all starts with the um, XSS vulnerability. But, I mean, you know how easy it is to get someone to click on a link, right? that there's two main types of XSS. There's, there's the stored XSS and reflected XSS. So stored is when, it actually, when the server actually stores your code. So it will send that code out to anyone who visits the site in the future. So you see that on stuff like forums and blogs where you can post user submitted messages. The other type is reflected XSS where it just um, prints back a message you gave it on a temporary web page. And the thing is that that requires you to get someone, ah, stupid projector. That requires you to get someone to visit a specific link. But on the other hand, it has a much more wider set of possible uh, applications. For example, if they put in a search engine and you type in like the HTML code as your search term and says, oh, there were no search results found for your term and then it puts your HTML code, like suddenly you've got reflected XSS. So like people might think, oh, I don't have to worry about this because I don't have any forms or blogs or whatever, and they're still vulnerable to reflected XSS. 
anyway, th this site here is an example of reflected XSS because the message you post is only included on that page you go to when you click go. So the thing is that the designers of the website said, oh, if you could read someone's cookie, then you could just log in as them, and that's bad, so we need to find a way to prevent that. So they came up with the HTTP only flag. So uh, when the server is creating a cookie, it can specify this flag, and then the browser sees that flag, and it knows this cookie is a special cookie that I uh, don't want JavaScript to see. So I'll only send the cookie on the normal HTTP requests and not provide access to it through JavaScript. So the thing is that HTTP only is commonly recommended as a defense against XSS. I think if you're here last semester, you probably would have seen someone say that. And so there's a few problems with that. The first thing, of course, is that XSS is really bad in its own right. Like you're executing your own code in their browser. You can do anything you want. So reading their cookies is just one evil thing you can do. So the first step is you really don't want to have XSS vulnerabilities in the first place. Now, there's a concept called defense in depth where it's, you say you want to have multiple defenses. So just in case our, we do have an XSS vulnerability somehow, at least they won't be able to read our cookies if we use both. Now, the second problem is that people don't always understand which, what HTTP only was meant to do. It only prevents you from reading the cookie from JavaScript, but there's still ways to overwrite the cookie. So you say, well, you may not be able to log in as the victim, but you could trick the victim into suddenly being logged in as you, and then like, for example, if they type something in, you might be able to go into their account history and see what they did or stuff like that. And HTTP only doesn't stop you from modifying your cookies, as I'll show here. So the, the first method is a problem I like to call the Spartacus cookie problem. I, and the problem stems from the cookie format. So I think some of you may have heard of the joke of write-only data. But the thing is that in HTTP, it's not a joke. That's actually how it was designed. So a cookie has uh, several different parts. There's the name, the value, the path, the flags, and the expiration date. So the server might say, set the value of the cookie foo to like XYZ at the path slash with expiration date next Tuesday and flags HTTP only, or something like that. But the problem is when the browser sends the cookie back to the server, all it sends is the name value pairs. So this might send foo equals XYZ, but it doesn't send the path or the expiration date or anything like that. I, as you can see here, I posted an ex uh, example of a cookie from Firebug. Where here's the name, here's the value, here's the, well, that's the domain, which is the website the cookie's associated with, size, path, and then the flags. So the path is a prefix for which the cookie will only be sent to requests that uh, start with that path prefix. And the original goal is a way to stop cookies from different pages on the same site from uh, conflicting with each other. So the thing is that that means that you can have multiple cookies with the same name if they have different paths. And the problem is that since the client doesn't send the path, that means that if you have multiple cookies with the same name and different paths, it will send multiple cookies with the same name, but the server doesn't see the path, so it has no way to tell the cookies apart. So, you know, in fact, yes? So does it see two cookies, or does it only see one that it logs in? It sees two cookies with the same name. It's, it's much like Spartacus. So the thing is that uh, most web frameworks will just arbitrarily pick one of the cookies and treat that as the actual cookie. If, if you go down to the like low level, you'll be able to see both cookies coming in, but you'll have no way to 
distinguish them. So at best, you can output an error condition. But most frameworks don't even do that. So anyway, here I have a demonstration. Uh, and the thing is that we have this cookie here called foo, whose value is OK, and which is HTTP only. And our goal is to change that. So you can just do, let's see here. I think I have it written down. Hold on. Sorry, I forgot to open this beforehand. So here's a piece of JavaScript code which will tell the browser to create a new cookie whose name is foo and whose value is evil. And you could specify a path for that, but uh, we actually don't have to because the browser will automatically create one at a valid path since the normal path conflicts because there's already a cookie there. So now you can see there's two cookies here. They both have the name foo, and they have different values with different paths. And so the server just picks one of them, and it picked our evil cookie. So even though we couldn't technically touch this HTTP-only cookie through JavaScript, we were still able to effectively modify its value. And However, there is a way to, like, if, what if you don't want to just create a new cookie? What if you want to replace the old one? The thing is, there's a way to do that as well. I'm just going to remove all these cookies so we can uh, start again. So the second attack is called cookie jar overflow. The problem is that for each site, the browser allocates a limited amount of space for cookies for that site. So if a site tries to store too many cookies, the browser will just start dropping old cookies. So of course, that means that with the JavaScript, you just create a whole bunch of new cookies until the protected HTTP-only cookie is dropped. And then you're free to create a new cookie with that name that's not HTTP-only. I, so I have the code prepared here. So uh, I, the thing is that if you, yes? Are you asking a question? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, it may depend on the browser, but in my experience, it appears to be FIFO. I, Anyway, the size of the cookie jar is also browser dependent. So if you wanted this to work reliably in different browsers, you'd have to add some extra code. But this is just a demonstration. So I'm uh, using the Firefox size, which just happens to be exactly 150 cookies. So as you can see, we have this loop here that just creates 149 throwaway cookies called x1, x2, x0, x1, x2, and so on. Now, it doesn't matter what the name or value of these cookies are. And then that overflows the cookie jar, so it deletes the foo cookie, so we can create our new cookie called foo. And then, since we're nice, we'll just go in and delete all the old, um, all the temporary cookies so that doesn't get cluttered up. And the way you delete a cookie is to give it an expiration date in the past, because they never bothered to create a way to officially delete cookies. So if we execute this, oh, yeah, you can do anything you want to your own cookies. This is what an attacker could do to your cookies. This is all through running JavaScript. Yes?
uh, when, when the server, if it has the same name in the path as the one that's on client side, it will just be overridden. If it has a different name or a different path, it will create a new cookie. Uh, I don't think the flags actually matter for that. So anyway, as you can see, now the old OK cookie is entirely gone. We just have our evil cookie here. So, yes? I deleted them in the second loop. I mean, you, you don't have to do that, but I, I just thought it'd be nice to avoid cluttering things up. Uh, you delete them by setting an expiration date in the past. So here I just grabbed Thursday to August 2001. I mean, you can put in any time you want. Like an actual framework will usually use like January 1970 because that's time zero. Yes? Yeah, well, like I said, the, the most common application is session fixation. Because you say, like, oh, I have this session with the server, and it'd be really nice if the victim was part of my session so I could see what they're trying to do. So you just give them your own session cookie, and suddenly you can see what they're doing. Or, like, if they're going to submit, like, the free money code or whatever, you just get them to submit it on your account instead of theirs. I mean, like, like you can overwrite a cookie. Like, just think of what you can do with that. Anyway, that's all I have uh, about the XSS stuff. I mean, I could start talking about other stuff if you want. But. Uh. Well, this, the sorting server is pretty hard, and I don't really want to spoil it for. So it has instructions on the home page here. Uh, yeah, it has. Um, actually, one of the actions is to display the source. Uh, something seems wrong. Let's see here. Okay, here. See what like you have three different actions you can do. There's the sort action, the check flag action, and the display source action. And it gives you examples of how to do all those. So for example, if you wanted to see the source, you could just do this. So this lets you just set up your own copy of the server if you want. I mean you'll obviously need to provide your own flag, but but it, it's it's very useful to be able to like test your attacks locally, for instance. Uh, Python. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a simple Python HTTP server. Those of you that are new, uh, what do you think so far? I know there's not too many of you here. Yes. So what? Um, that that's that's you're a mechanical engineer. So uh, your computer science background is how much? Okay. So so if if you needed to program something, you could do it. Okay, uh, so in that case, um, there's a lot of sort of tutorials online. There's stuff like on exploitexercises.com where they will actually give you ISOs that you can pop up in uh, virtual platforms and basically you break into those. 
Um, there is Coreland.be that has a ton of tutorials on how to write exploits and stuff like that. Uh, there's, there's really quite a few resources, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but we have a pretty substantial list of them on the, on the site, correct? On the wiki. Yeah, so if you go to greyhat.gottech.edu and you go to the wiki, there should be um, a page there which has a pretty extensive list of places where you can get started. If there's something in particular that you're interested in, I'd be happy to elaborate upon that. But if you're just looking for how to break into uh, the field as a whole, that would be a good place to start. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that, that would also be something cool to look at. Uh, Java byte code, from my understanding, is pretty. Uh, well, the, well, the, the thing is, it's easier than actually use Citrix that way, but no one cares about it, so no one will be bothered to learn it. Did you send us uh, Java byte code? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, are there any tools that you all would like to see demonstrated? Maltigo. What is Maltigo? Okay. Multigo. Okay. That's Multigo. Interesting. Okay. That that sounds that sounds pretty cool. Any any other suggestions? Uh, we have we have I believe coming up next week we'll have the social engineering toolkit. And lots of VMs, so so that should be pretty awesome. Yes. Wireshark. So yes, we will be having Tori. You still are planning on doing a talk on Wireshark, correct? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I can I can lend a hand with that as well. Definitely Wireshark. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Wireshark, there's really uh, it's a pretty superb tool for network traffic analysis. Um, you would have to make a pretty convincing argument to make me think that there's a better tool out there than Wireshark. It is extensive in its capabilities. Yeah, whatever. Uh, OK, so we have Wireshark. We have Mal Maltigo or Mantigo? Maltigo. OK, and then uh, we have Social Engineering Toolkit coming up. Um, I think I would like to take another swing at the uh, damn vulnerable web server that was completely secure the last time that we tried to uh, break, on it, break it. I'm going to look at the source and see why that flag wasn't actually being uh, reset so that I don't stumble along like that once more. Um, so that, yes? Sorry. The other kind of key thing is, uh, have you, have you all heard of the community? Yeah. yeah. So the debugger they have, mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see. I mean, I don't know if you are, but uh, debugger they use. And uh, they have also sort of a library of exports. I forget the name of it. Yeah. Canvas. Yeah. OK. Um, there's that, and then the, the other one that I've, I've used is Ali Debug. And uh, yeah, it, it seems to be like, I don't know, Vim versus, uh, uh, what, what is it? What is it? The war between. Yeah, yeah, Vim versus Emacs. Basically, which one is the best? Well, it depends on which side of the war you're on, but they're both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so I, yeah, I think, that would be, I think that would be great to just go through um, maybe basically some reverse engineering. What I could show, what I could potentially show, um, is how to patch a binary file with a reverse shell. And, uh, and you can, yeah, so it's actually pretty cool. You can take any .exe file you want, and then carve out a little slice of it, and then throw some, throw some uh, shell code into it. And basically, it will run completely normally. And this is, this is anything you want, any .exe file that you want, uh, that I guess there's certain security implications that they don't uh, put in place. But it will connect back out to you right when the user runs the application, and they will be no wiser. Um, and and I've used done that you doing Ali debug, so that's yeah. Were you gonna were you gonna say something or no? February nineteenth. Okay, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so we have uh, we have a handful. I have I have a handful of contacts that uh, we could potentially get talks with. I know I've mentioned that before. Um, but that will probably be towards the second half of the semester since we're running through all the tools at the beginning. Um, 
yeah, and so I guess I guess that's just about wraps it up for today. Uh, sorry for those of you that came in right when the uh, lecture ended. Uh, is there any any additional commentary? Any additional questions? Okay. Well, uh, there's still plenty of pizza left, so as usual, come get free pizza, please. I'm so tired of eating it. Uh, and, and and make sure you sign in as well, so that we can continue to get spurious amounts of pizza. All right, guys. Thanks for coming out. I think I could tell Charlie we have four or less talks.